right, The Unseen World of the Bible, Section 7, The Rules of Engagement, that is, between enemy forces of which we are involved. My objectives for today include the following. First, at the end of this session, we will all be able to recount how God defeated the gods of Egypt. Secondly, you will be able to describe what God requires of human beings. And thirdly, you will explain reasons for suffering. Now, we just had a good message on how to suffer on a roller coaster. <laughs> a good illustration of uh, our current life. Jennifer was in ER last evening with our grandson. Another little bump along the way. He's, he's all right. <clears throat> Remember, you can always download a document of this session and the PowerPoint slides from this site. The lesson theme for today, if we go away with no other idea than this one, you've got the essence of it. We are God's new human council on earth. And when we are glorified, we will join his divine family in the new Eden. So God is making up his forever family. It consists both of the invisible beings whom he has created in the heavens and <coughs> us material spiritual beings who we created to occupy this earth. Three points of review. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted uh, heritage. All right, what's the main idea we got from these verses last time? Well, God gave the nations to the other gods with the exception of Israel, which he claimed for his. Those other gods, have they existed forever? Where did they come from? God. God created them, put them in charge of the nations, except one a nation that he had not even invented yet. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. In you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now this follows the putting in charge of other gods over the nations. So what's the main point? But he's going to bless, he's bless them bless and bring them back. back. I said you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like then, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall all the All right, so eventually, who's going to be God over all the nations? Yeah, no. Yes, not these temporary uh, spiritual beings with whom we are currently in a kind of struggle. Remember, we do not struggle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in the heavenly realm. That being the background then, Yahweh had a plan, what he's going to do through Israel to bless the nations. But this includes a long period of suffering. Now, just as he had created Adam and Eve and said, multiply and fill the earth, in order to occupy, subdue. Now, starting with a new nation, they have to do the same thing. They have to multiply and become numerous. Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out. So, did God know what was going to happen down in Egypt? Yes. Yeah. So did he make a mistake by letting them go there? <laughs> Living in Egypt, who will be the ruling gods? The Egyptian gods. The Egyptians' gods will be rulers. And these people, this people are going to have to multiply for several generations under that kind of domination. Do you ever have the opportunity to go live in a non-Christian country or work here for a period of time? I recommend it. Just go have that experience. In fact, we live in one right now. <laughs> but he would bring judgment on that nation, and afterwards they will come out. Is Yahweh able to bring real good out of real evil? Yes. 
Do not fear, for I am in the place of God. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Right. So you know the story of Joseph who was taken captive into Egypt, was faithful to Yahweh, and eventually was made some kind of a vizier to the, the Pharaoh of Egypt and put in charge of collecting enough food during, during years of plenty that they could feed not only Egypt but surrounding nations during seven years of famine. It was his own brothers who had sold him into slavery. Afterwards, dependent upon him for their own survival, they were concerned now that with all the power he held, he might try to get even with them, punish them for what they had done to him. But his advice was, don't be afraid. God sent me here to save you guys. Now, that model of one who is a member of your own people, whom you reject, whom you send off possibly to die, but who becomes your savior, is there any other instance of that in scripture? <laughs> what were his reasons then for allowing he, uh, his people to become servants and literally slaves eventually, not for 400 years, but for the maybe the decade or two towards the end of that, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. So it was, it was time now for Yahweh to bring Israel out of Egypt, but on the way out, they have a great lesson they have to learn. They had been living in relative peace most of that time under the other gods, the gods of Egypt. <clears throat> now it was time for them to experience deliverance under their own god, Yahweh, through his messenger, Moses. Who's Yahweh? I don't know him. Why should I obey your god? Now, there's something we need to realize about Pharaoh. It's not so clear from scripture, but it's very clear from archaeology and the literature of Egypt itself. And that's this. By this time in history, Pharaoh was believed to be an incarnation of the god Horus. And as such, it was Pharaoh's responsibility to keep the gods busy doing their task. For example, bringing the waters every year up the Nile to water the farms and to suppress the frogs and the fleas and the flies <laughs> and to, to keep the Egyptians alive. And one of the reasons for the building of the pyramids, besides feeding energy up to flying saucers, <laughs> I do watch the internet, <laughs> um, was building mountains. Remember, from antiquity, where do the gods dwell? Top of, Top of mountains. Reason for building of towers. And one of the reasons for the pyramids is you put that god in there to keep him happy. Horus, the first known national god specifically related to the ruling pharaoh who in time came to be regarded as a manifestation of Horus in life and of the god Osiris in death. Now Osiris is an interesting case study because he was the ancient god who died, came back to life every year. And if you go on the internet or attend university, you will be taught that Christianity simply borrowed the doctrine of death and resurrection from the Egyptians. And therefore, whoever came out of Egypt brought that story with them and eventually converted it into Jesus. Well, there's some problems with that theory. For example, uh, how often did Jesus die and resurrect? <laughs> and he did, did he do it off in the invisible realm of Walla Walla Land? No. <laughs> no, he did it in time and space and with 
Eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses, thank you. <laughs> uh, this is, this is who we're talking about. Pharaoh believed himself to be an incarnate God and who would eventually have that kind of power over the future history. So why should he obey Yahweh? Now, the name Yahweh has been found in the last few years in Egyptian hieroglyphics and documentation. So the Egyptians, they knew the name of Yahweh, but at the time, Yahweh was believed to be a minor god somewhere down in the southeastern part of uh, what today we would call the Middle East. Here's Yahweh's response. Pharaoh has a son, remember, who is going to become the next incarnation, but Yahweh also has a son who eventually is going to be an incarnation. Say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, then I will kill your firstborn son. I don't know how, after all these years of reading the Bible, I never saw that verse. That he warned ahead of time, if you, if you mess with my child, I will mess with your child. Eventually, it happens. Yahweh does execute judgment on all of the gods of Egypt. Now, you've heard this explained many times, it's in the footnotes of your Bibles, that every time a Moses prayed and the Lord sent a plague upon Egypt, that plague corresponded to the power of an Egyptian god. And the gods were not able to stop the, the plague. I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. Yes. Now, he had already demonstrated that the gods have no power compared to his own, but there's something more here. Upon all of these gods of Egypt, I will ex execute judgment. You want to know who I am? <laughs> I'm Yahweh. Learn that name. God, which of the gods was executed that night? The son of the incarnate God. And eventually we know that Yahweh also has a son. First identified as Israel in general, and later will be identified as a particular Israelite, the promised Messiah. Afterwards, Moses had something to say about this. He was as, as astounded as everyone else. You know, he sometimes wondered, what was Yahweh going to do next? Who's like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who's like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? He did do those plagues. Nothing of Egypt's gods or, or Pharaoh could stop it. You're powerless. So, he did demonstrate his greater power. Did he deny that the gods exist? No. No, no. no he never did. In fact, that's the astounding thing. That's right. He acknowledged their existence, but as we saw in Psalm 82, many of the gods over the nations somehow failed or rebelled or they turned bad as all creatures are wont to do. He is majestic in holiness. Now we're glad to understand holiness. Next week we will do, deal with the concept of sacred space. That there are places and time and space and in communities where Yahweh dwells. And that's sacred. Behind this idea of his holiness, he is completely different. So much so that he cannot be seen or heard directly. But he is able to communicate, as we shall see shortly. And here he communicates very kinetically through exercising judgment. He stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. The crossing of the Reed Sea in some miraculous manner. This was God, by God exercising his right hand. What is it about the right hand? Authority. Don't. Uh, strength and authority and, by the way, cleanliness. If you ever live in an eastern part of the world or the southern part of the world, your left hand is for everything dirty. 
or defiling. So, for example, if I wanted to offer a cup to Jill, and I took it in my left hand. Oh my. <laughs> oh, you would never do that. So, in the Jesus film, there's this scene where Jesus is interacting with a, a lady of the streets. And he picks up peaches of fruit out of one person's basket with his left hand and offers it to her to show how merciful and gracious he is towards someone who doesn't deserve it. But if you're from the eastern part of the world, Jesus handing that apple with from his left hand was an insult, saying, you're dirty. So if you ever produce a film, Make sure you know. <laughs> consult with an anthropologist. <laughs> so we don't make that faux That's right. Ooh, faux pas. I like that. All right. Did the other nations hear about this? Jethro said, Blessed be Yahweh, who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. All right. Now, what do you know about Jethro? Father-in-law of Moses, but what kind of work did he do? He was a priest of the region of Median, or the Medianites. Well, as a priest of the Medianites, what god was he serving? The Medianite god. The Medianite god. He was not, up until this point, although he knew Moses well, he knew Moses as an escaped Egyptian. When Jethro himself hears about this, and who would ever believe his son-in-law? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said, all right, I've heard the story. It's, the, the accounts seem to be reliable. The eyewitnesses who have come back said, yes, it really happened. And so, uh, okay, Yahweh did this. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods, because in this affair, they dwelt arrogantly with the people. Right. So what has he done now? What is he going to do with the God of the Medianites? At least to mow him. Now, he, he hasn't denied that they exist, but you now recognize, oh, there is a greater God. Remember, Yahweh was foreign to Egypt. So in ancient thought, Yahweh would have no authority over Egypt. But Yahweh goes to the hardest place to demonstrate, yes, I do. <laughs> and so if, he, if Yahweh was able to deliver the Israelites from the Egyptians, the relatively weak minor god of the Medianites, he counts for very little anymore. So what is he going to do next? He's now conf confessed what happened. He now confesses Yahweh. And there's one more step. If you confess a god, what do you do? Make an offering. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. So lots of things happening in this verse. Uh, why burnt offerings or sacrifices? If there's a God who is all-powerful and creator, what does he need with our lousy sacrifices? Why would he be pleased with all that blood? Well, next week we'll deal with um, why sacrifices. And what's this? Aaron and all the elders, and they eat bread with Moses' father-in-law? What's happening here? Dealing with an unclean person? Uh, well, Aren't we all? Okay, but socially, there's something going on here sociologically. Is that respect showing? They're showing lots of respect, but they are also putting him in a position of authority within Israel. You know the story. Moses was so busy trying to solve everybody's problems that he was kept busy all day and into the night, while people were queued up sometimes for days trying to get an audience with Moses. And Jethro was the one who said, Moses, what's wrong with you? Listen to me, I'll give you advice. 
And so Moses said, here's what you should do. These 70 elders, you should empower them to empower group leaders over thousands who will be leaders over hundreds, who will be leaders over fifties, and leaders over ten. Which, by the way, is the perfect model for multiplying your church through small groups. And uh, did Moses accept the advice? Was Moses out of the will of God listening to this former pagan? No. No, we know it was not because in the book of Deuteronomy, he institutes the system as permanent for Israel. He said, when you choose these leaders, they have to meet certain qualifications. When you go over to 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 2, entrusting what I've, you learned from me to other faithful men, they meet the same qualifications, or very similar. Israel has more to learn. They now recognize, okay, our, our ancient God, Yahweh, he's, he's the one, he's delivered us out of the country, but they brought with them, what did they bring with them, by the way, when they left Egypt? Those foreign gods. Some did. Some brought with them their little statues. They also brought with them a lot of Egyptians. Last evening, reading in an archaeology magazine, I read by a very confident speed writer that the number of Israelites who came out of Egypt, impossible. They didn't have time enough to multiply that large. Furthermore, it would not have been possible to lead them, and with those many herds, they could not have advanced but a kilometer to a day anyway. So it never happened. <laughs> well, when they came out, they brought a lot of Egyptians with them, who also brought their gods, or their paraphernalia. So they had a lot more to learn. So we know the story of how Yahweh called Moses to meet with him on a mountaintop someplace. Why a mountaintop? That's where God is. That's where God meet human beings, at least in the tradition. The Lord gave me the two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on them were all the words that the Lord had spoken with you on the mountain. How did this uh, law get delivered then to Moses? First audibly. By that fighting thing that carved the stone. Yeah, that, that finger that carved the stone. But whose finger was that? Well, notice it's the switch here from the Lord to God. It's, there is a distinction between Yahweh and Elohim. Because what can Elohim also mean besides the name for the one true God? The gods. Just gods, yeah. Yeah, it's plural. It's plural. Unless it has a singular verb. In essence, he's saying here, with the finger of the gods. Well, are we on the right track or are we deceiving ourselves because we like these strange ideas? A New Testament passage. The righteous one whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep them. Uh, that law was actually delivered by angels. It was given from Yahweh. But Yahweh is so majestic, so spiritual, so invisible, and so great. Uh, he's the inventor of hands. He didn't have hands to start with. Contrary to the major uh, American religion. The message declared by angels proved to be reliable. Uh, the First Testament scriptures were completely reliable. They always came true and had been given to Israel by angelic intermediaries. By the way, do we have an intermediary with God? Yes. Oh, we do. Can't we come to God directly? Yes. Well, what about Mary? Can we come to God through Mary? No. no. Well, who? Okay. <laughs> now, this law that was given had a purpose. This people wasn't really ready to represent him to the nations, aside from their testimony of a one-time deliverance. They needed training. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. <coughs> Do not turn to idols or make for yourselves any gods of cast metal. I am the Lord, your God. It might to be very clear now, it's written, it's declared, it's to be taught, uh, you shall be holy. Now, does that mean morally perfect? 
That would have been pretty hard. Uh, you'll never commit, commit a theft. You'll never drive over the speed limit. <laughs> holy meaning in the context. What does holy mean? What is he saying about himself? Be without sin. He is without sin, but in this context, he's not talking about sin. What is he talking about? Set aside for God in having him as one and God. All right, if we're talking about an in, a human or an object, it would be set aside for God. But here is God himself who is holy. In this context, just in this verse, it, should, it will suddenly pop out, of the, out for you. Holy means I am totally different. There is no admixture. You cannot mix the gods of the nations with me. So in the Ten Commandments, it will be, you shall have no other god before me. In other words, don't set up any idol in my presence. If you do, I will not only crush it, I will crush you. The Lord will establish you as a people holy to himself, and all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord. All right, so now the term holy shifts to the people. And in this context, again, what is holiness talking about? Moral perfection? Moral improvement, definitely, that, that eventually comes. Holy to himself. Belonging to him. Belonging to him. Dedicated to him and to him alone. One of the reasons for which, in the course of biblical history, monogamy became the ideal. And in many countries, the law. In fact, in many Islamic countries to this day, when you marry a wife, at least legally, the judge asks her, will this be a monogamous marriage or a polygamous marriage? And she decides. And of course, under pressure from her family. All right, so what was Yahweh's purpose then in declaring himself holy and his people to be holy to him? If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Right, so now it goes beyond just a holy people, it becomes a holy nation. But a, a priestly nation. Now you might think, oh, this is a nation that has priests. Isn't that convenient? Well, almost every society on earth has priests. But what's the point here? What is the function of a priest? What do priests do? Well, I guess, isn't the um, priest sort of kind of a, a special connection between God and his people? Exactly, right. But in this case, the people are already his. Now they are to be served as priests to whom? The All the peoples. So the function of Israel then was to represent and to bring the knowledge of Yahweh to all the nations of the world. And then of course to intercede on their behalf and pray for them. Of course this involves making disciples and teaching as well. God's purpose, I take it then, was to Israel to draw the other nations towards himself. Did they ever succeed at that? Yes. Yes. How? Well, there were people who came into the problem nations to join Israel. Yeah, many joined Israel, and they heard about God's greatness. Some were attracted to Solomon's temple. Especially when Israel became very wealthy, other nations were jealous of the wealth, and they would serve Yahweh, at least temporarily, to see if they couldn't get on to the grading train. Yes. And in a sense, in the end, Israel did, gave the final um, ministry to the world because Jesus Christ was a Jew. Exactly. Yeah, that's where it all head to. Likewise, when Paul was doing his missionary work, and even before Paul, there were other Christian missionaries, mostly sent out from Jerusalem. So you have the Petrine approach to mission, and followed by the Pauline approach to mission, which are reflected in the New Testament. 
The, uh, the setting up of synagogues during the dispersion into the nations, many, perhaps thousands, thousands definitely, and perhaps tens of thousands of pagans had converted to Judaism, or they began worshiping the God of Israel by the ministry of the synagogues. And so Paul normally, first, when he came to a town or a city, he went first where? This is Looking for home. Gentiles, Gentiles thank you. who had become Yahweh worshippers. And because he knew through them, he could tap into huge extended social networks, family systems, which is how the gospel primarily spreads to this day, not through charlatans shouting on from stages. A light to the nations, a light to the peoples. Nations shall come to your light, that my salvation may read to the end of the earth. Okay, here, got it. The Lord is very explicit in these texts. This is why I'm sending you into the world, and the nations will come to your light. This will happen. There'll be some real delays along the way, <laughs> lots of failures. Now, uh, there is something, however, that Yahweh requires. These, these images you see on the screen, at first glance I thought, oh, look, ancient pagan gods. Until I looked at the uh, inscription that was given, you know, these are images of worshipers. Those who are giving their adoration to pagan gods. So there were separate statues or idols that the gods couldn't dwell. You know, worship of a god is primarily a matter of loyalty. You serve that god. You talk about it. You sacrifice to it. You recommend it to others. I have, I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. <clears throat> okay, I have trusted in your love. Didn't notice this verse does not say, I kept all your Ten Commandments impeccably, or I gave all those sacrifices. It's rather, I trusted that you really love me. In fact, the term here, I think, is chesed, which itself means loyal love. We offer to him loyal obedience and faith. He offers to us loyal love, steadfast love. And my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Was there any salvation in the First Testament? Yes. Of course. Mm -hmm. O oh Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you, shall be put to shame. For they have forsaken the Lord, the foundation of living water. Right. The foundation of living water. Wow. That's what Jesus claimed to be later. Did all Israelites remain faithful to Yahweh? No. No. Some scholars suggest that perhaps the majority of Israelites eventually forsook Yahweh to go after other gods or try to abuse Yahweh for pecuniary purposes. How do the righteous live? By faith. By faith, yeah. And a summary statement of scripture cited in the New Covenant as well, the New Testament. If you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, then solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. So God promises life to those who remain faithful to him. He promises death to those who forsake him. And the Lord, to this day, Yahweh still requires really new loyalty. Before we go much further, we might be tempted sometimes to think that well, the, the champions, the patriarchs, the heroes of the First Testament, they must have been marvelous men and women. <laughs> they never did anything wrong from their childhood. They served Yahweh with all their heart, right? Oh, oh. oh. well. There's some bumps. There is a bump. <laughs> However, every one of the men listed here, as far as we know, we will someday get to talk with in the coming kingdom because we believe that, yeah, they, uh, there's one thing they never did. They never gave up their faith in Yahweh. However, what did Adam do? For example, he listened to the devil, he disobeyed God, 
And the consequence was that all his posterity died. All right, what did Noah, how did he mess up? He actually did mess up. He got drunk. He got drunk. <laughs> right, he certainly did. Uh, there are some other things that are difficult to talk about. Another thing, terrible thing that happened resulted in his cursing his own grandson. How did Abraham mess up? Lied. He lied to Ishmael. And right. Oh, I should have sorry, I should have said. Yes. Okay. I did watch I watched that slave girl for some time. All right, and Lot. Uh, Abraham's Read. He made a lot of bad Greed. choices. He did. He agreed. He said, I'll take the best. Yes. Okay. And where did he go? To Sodom. Yes. He went and uh, moved to Sodom. And there, which led eventually to his committing of incest. Jacob. What did Jacob do? <laughs> he lied to his father and cheated his brother. <laughs> Okay. Judah. Oh, the scripture makes a point that Messiah is descended from Judah. He must have been a marvelous chap. Lied to his And then. It's sort of disgusting. Yeah. Who turned out to be a relative. <laughs> but uh, he didn't know it. So, bad choice. Moses. Murder. 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 He did. He committed murder. Disobedience. Disobedience. Did he want to go talk for Yahweh? Yeah. No. 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 And the thing for which he was forbidden to enter Canaan mm -hmm. was something else. Yeah. He reacted in anger when he wanted something from Yahweh. Specifically, he struck the rock a second time. Oh, David is our favorite. We teach David in all of our Sunday school classes. About the slingshot and murder and another oh, man's oh, yeah. oh my. Yeah, he murdered men and committed adultery. Well, what did he never do? He never forsook his going away. Solomon? He allowed idolatry in Jerusalem. And Jonah? <laughs> he ran out of the way. I've met old, old folk in my life who said, God called me to mission, but I wouldn't go. Uh, however, they still had their faith in, in Yahweh, in Jesus. So let's nail this down. What does Yahweh require of human beings? Before we read the verse, you tell me. Loyal faith. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Right. We must be saved, but there's no other name. In fact, when you look at the, the major religions, they all talk about salvation and how you might get saved if you keep all their rules, but even then, Allah Himself will decide. Or, well, you'll have to spend a few centuries in purgatory, purgatory and maybe get out of there. It's always maybe. Forget centuries. But in scripture, yeah. in, script, in, in scripture, if you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and remain loyal to him, you have everlasting life. You will be resurrected. Uh, meanwhile, you'll be filled with his Holy Spirit, and you will participate with him in the renewed Eden. God, severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you provided you continue in his kindness. So the great Romans chapters that talk about wonderful uh, wonderful salvation, uh, it is made conditional. Continue in what? Trying as hard as you can? No. Or faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. Indeed, you continue to in the faith, stable and steadfast, no shifting from the hope of the gospel. Well, the gospel gives us hope that God requires nothing of me than my loyalty to Jesus Christ. I will not abandon him nor serve another. But Yahweh, 
Hey, he rewards your loyal faith in many ways. Let's look at some of them. You who held fast to the Lord, your God, are all alive today. Most of the Israelites crossing the wilderness perished because many of them had abandoned faith in Yahweh. The book of Hebrews says, I think in the old version, they did not mix the promises with faith. Because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. But that's why you, you think differently, feel differently, behave differently now, believe differently, react differently to others. The spirit has uh, dwelt you. Beloved, we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet been up here. So we are declared to be the children of God, or the sons of God, a title of the divine council by the way of the First Testament, applied now to Christian believers in the New Testament. Uh, oh, is it apparent that this is what we are? Not yet. It's hard even to imagine some of our own church members really being Christians. <laughs> but definitely, the, most of the society around us does not see us to be anything other than weak-minded you know, religious nuts. Mm -hmm. But the promise of Jesus is this. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. Right. Okay. So, we will share in the authority that Jesus Christ has over the nations. And what about all the angelic beings? We have to judge angels. Yes, you are to judge the angels. Now that will may include passing judgment on some that were disobedient, but the term judge used in scripture usually means you are a lesser authority in charge of part of the, the territory and those who live in it. It's more like the role of a magistrate in Europe. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Yeah, so um, we still walk around in carrying the image of the man of dust with these dusty bodies that return to dust. But just as Jesus is risen and glorified, so shall we be. So what is our task as uh, believing, loyal followers of the Lord Jesus? To bring the nations to him? Hey, did you know that there are millions of Christian Arabs? In Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. You are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Well, it's nice to know that God considers me an adopted son, but in the width and breadth of scripture, to be a son of God is much more than just simply being added in the family. We now become God's counsel on earth. And in fact, we become the living, lively part of Israel. Has God set aside Israel? Scripture actually poses the question, has God rejected his ancient people? And the answer to Scripture is no. I myself, I'm one of them. I, I believe in Jesus. So there's always been a believing contingent of Israel down through the centuries, and it continues to this day. And all of us who put our trust in the Messiah, we become members of Israel as Abraham's offspring. Heirs according to the promise. What promise? The promise to Abraham. Now, promise is made to Abraham. It included uh, a land, which of course one day will be returned to Messiah. But the promise that all the nations would be blessed through Israel. In fact, our becoming members of Israel brings a blessing to our people group. So what did Jesus say to do? Disciples. Yeah. Make disciples of all the nations. Uh, by the way, it's your and my uh, responsibility, you'll forgive us if we fail, but it's still the responsibility is delegated to us. Of course, it's something we cannot do. He has to do it, but he needs, our, he needs us to be there. And that is, in some way or another, you and I, cooperating together, must ensure that the gospel is getting to parts of the world where it is still unknown. Geographically, there aren't many left, but there are a few ethnic people throughout the world who are still yet to receive the gospel. Not many, but they're scattered and hard to get to. 
Okay, is this going to succeed? For the Lord, you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Okay, now we're learning how to take a concept such as holiness and put that in the same verse with the concept or the, the mention of nations. In other words, he tolerates no other gods. And so no other gods have any future as in that function. But rather the nations will come and worship you, which is what was prayed for in Psalm 82. Kind of a summary then. The apostles did so by continually starting and multiplying new churches. That's the, that's the story of the book of Acts. In fact, I put up on the website a document listing the 70 nations mentioned in the book of Acts, which correspond to the 70 nations that were scattered at, after the time of Babylon and the 70 elders of Israel, and the 70 whom Jesus sent out. was At first he sent out a group of 12 tribes of Israel, <clears throat> then he sent out 70 symbolic of the nations. So here's a summary. God created Eden, dwelling there with divine council members and with human beings. However, the devil rebelled and deceived humans to disobey God, thereby bringing death and banishment. But, at the same time, God promised that a human being would one day crush the serpent's head. Then after the humans disobeyed, disobeyed at Babel, God placed them under divine council members as their gods. But many of those gods failed at their task, so they will be deposed, dying like men, assigned to the underworld. To continue God's plan, he called Abraham promising to bless all the nations through his descendants, one in particular. But then he promised life to Israelites who would remain loyal to him alone, but gave them the law, first as a covenant, his promise to them, and in order to suppress sin. Furthermore, it's a test of loyalty. If you are loyal to Yahweh, you would want to abide by his instructions. That's why Jesus said, if you love me, you will Obey my commands. Then Jesus came eventually as Abraham's human descendant to bless Israel and the nations. To do this, he had to die. He died to free us from sin and death, rising to reign over the nations. These humans then, all humans who put their faith in Jesus, remaining loyal to him, receive everlasting life. But God has charged us Christian believers to make disciples of all the nations. Jesus returned, we loyal believers will reign with him over the nations, judging angels. However, the loyal council members, and along with us saved humans, will dwell with God and Christ forever in the new Eden, also called the new heaven last point to make here is that disloyal council members and humans will be excluded from Eden forever.